Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the MLA Sheep Productivity and Profitability Webinar Series. Tonight's webinar is called Finishing Lambs and Grain This Summer and Will It Pay? Tonight's presenter is Jeff Duddy, Director and Consultant at Sheep Solutions. My name is David Brown and I work with Home Sackett, the webinar conveners for 2017 and 18. Before we move on, I'd just like to let everyone know that next week, uh, Bruce Allworth is going to be presenting on Thursday evening at 8 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. And Jeff is going to be presenting on uh, shearing lambs for growth rate. Is it worth it? So Jeff's got considerable experience in this space, um, being a consultant, uh, vet and a producer himself. And he's going to be taking a close look at the um, age-old uh, cons adage of, you know, knock the wool off them and they'll get to, they'll finish a lot quicker and he'll be sort of teasing out the biological reasons why that may or may not work and some of the instances where you should and, and shouldn't do it. So that's going to be next Thursday at 8pm Australian Easter Daylight Savings Time um, uh, with Bruce Allworth. You should be able to see this control panel in the top right hand corner of your screen. Now that red arrow button on the left of the control panel collapses and reinstates it, so you, it's not covering the presentation tonight. Now you should be able to hear us, uh, but I can't hear you. That questions box there at the bottom of the control panel is an important part of tonight's presentation. Uh, it's where we'd like you to put your questions in for Jeff as he pushes through the presentation and they will come up there chronologically and at the end of the uh, webinar, Jeff has kindly um, offered to stay online as long as we need so that we may be able to get those questions answered. So anyone's uh, welcome to put uh, some comments or questions in the box as we go and um, I welcome you to, to do that. Uh, our visit creates a lively and um, interesting question time at the end. So tonight's presenter is Jeff Duddy. Uh, Jeff is a widely regarded independent sheep consultant. He's been working across South East Australia for many years, backed by 27 years of experience with New South Wales DPI as a sheep and wool extension officer. Jeff is recognised as a lamb feedlotting specialist and he's definitely the right man to be presenting this webinar tonight. Jeff co-developed the Sheep CRC lamb feedlot calculator and is also an accredited, accredited deliverer of many nationally recognised workshops and programs, including Breadwell, Fedwell, Ram Select, Lifetime New Management and others. Jeff also offers one-on-one -on -one uh, -on -one advice in all facets of sheep nutrition, production, management and marketing. So with that, I'm going to uh, welcome Jeff to the webinar. Um, Good evening, Jeff. Are you with us? I surely am. How are you? Yeah, really well. Thank you, Jeff. Now, I'm just going to transfer the screen across to you so you can take over the presentation. Just let us know when you're ready to go there. Yep. No worries. Yeah, we're um, I'm right to go. Have you got the screen up at the moment? My, my first slide? Yes, sure do, Jeff. Excellent. I'll see hear you in about 30 minutes. All right. Thanks, Marty. Welcome everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank Holmes and Sackett and MLA for the opportunity to present tonight. Um, today's or tonight's webinar will look at the profitability and the risk factors associated with grain finishing crossbreed lambs. That was the brief. We do have some supplemental um, slides uh, which we can use in question time if we have questions on the profitability and the like of finishing merino lambs. Specifically looking at the next couple of months and whether or not um, it's going to be profitable to actually finish these lambs into the summer months. Apologies. What we'll actually cover uh, will be store lamb starting price and most people would understand that the uh, high store lamb prices really have a big impact on your profitability. Um, we'll look at that and uh, we'll run through an example, a couple of examples I've done on the feedlot calculator. We'll look at variable feed and additive costs, um, principally looking at different ration costs 
Um, what I've used is a barley lupin mix with uh, cereal hay. Doesn't really matter which you go with, um, uh, as long as you take into account issues like potential acidosis or grain poisoning issues and the like. And importantly, look at seasonal price variations and what's likely to happen in the approaching months. Uh, I was talking to a few major processors today and there are no contracts currently available. So we really haven't got a ballpark figure to work off to uh, look at, okay, what are we likely to receive from these finished trade lambs when we do put them through the feedlot? I use the uh, sheep CRC feedlot calculator. I'll just run you through quickly some of the basic information that I included. The uh, landed stall lamb value I put down at $6.80, um, which is the current uh, current price and also the average price for 2017. So that was a gross value of $120 for that 17 kilo stall lamb. Finished trade lamb value, $6.15, the $6.25 average for the year. Uh, you'll understand I've actually dropped it a little bit at the moment because we are in the period when generally lamb prices drop off relative to the average price across the year with uh, because of supply. Ration costs, I looked at anywhere from $150 to $300 a tonne. Um, bearing in mind a few factors here with, uh, you know, if you are able to harvest some of the crops that were drought affected in uh, Eastern Australia in particular, you may well have some low value grains that you can use. Um, but also bearing in mind that given the fact that uh, our harvest is uh, yields are likely to be down that we probably will see fairly high grain prices going into the summer. Additive cost, I've used a basic additive cost of $12.50 a tonne, that's a lime salt basic um, uh, input cost. We could also, I know there are other systems out there where you can buy premixes uh, that will cost anywhere from $30 to so up to $110 a tonne of ration more. Yeah. Um, what I'd like to just show is really your ration costs are not a big component of a, um, of a feedlotting program at the moment. So if you feel more comfortable buying in pre-mixes and they do the job for you, it's not going to make a big impact on the um, end result. <clears throat> We're doing crossbreed lambs. I've assumed they're shorn or short wool when born, uh, sorry, when bought. Um, I haven't included uh, uh, wool returns in any of this analysis. Um, because it gets really finicky and, and difficult to do across a, a range of uh, situations. Um, we're using self feeders with a barley lupin mix, cereal hay and the additives I've mentioned. I've worked on 280 grams a head per day growth rate from day of entry through to when the lambs finish in the feedlot. Um, and, that, and we're taking them from 17 kilos carcass weight through to a 23 kilo carcass weight, a good heavy trade lamb and at 280 grams a day average across that six weeks period, um, that's all it takes to finish them to that uh, heavier weight. Labor, uh, and these are some of the things that you guys out there don't really include. Um, in self-feeding systems where you might only be filling the feeders once a week or so, uh, generally it's around five cents um, per lamb per day. Operating costs, um, ATO sort of basis, uh, you're looking somewhere around $13 per tonne of feed to feed out. And I've included also overdraft on, on purchasing lambs, working on about 8%. About $3 per head in introduction costs, they basically include all your vaccines, drenches, and the like that you uh, might actually use prior to introducing the lambs into the feedlot. Transport, we've assumed $2 a head in and $3 per head out. Commissions and the like uh, work on 5.5%. Five five and, um, and you've got your standard um, slaughter levy of $1.50. This graph I just want to show you is, um, is the, basically the change in, um, in our land prices over the last, excuse me, um, since 2004. If you look at those lines, you've got, you'll see that they all follow the same trend. You've got your blue on the bottom, which is the merino lamb, 16 to 22 kilo. You have the dark blue, which is the trade lamb, and the heavy lambs are the green. So they run very close to each other on a cents per kilo basis. But what I want to just really highlight is our store lamb prices. And if you look back to 2011, when we had record prices and then a bit of a backlash going into 2012, Store lamb prices were trading well and truly above our trade lamb prices on a cents per kilo base. 
and we are approaching the same territory at the moment. I think there's a number of reasons for that is that um, there is so much confidence in the lamb industry that people are willing to buy lambs and finish them. Um, we have so few people actually breeding. We have a, a, a very low ewe flock. Um, we are improving lambing uh, survival and weaning percentages, which is helping out. Um, but again, there's just so much confidence in the industry. A lot of people probably haven't got the infrastructure or don't want to go back into breeding and are quite happy to actually look at just finishing store lambs when the opportunity presents itself. Looking at those changes just over the last 12 months, if you look, the store lambs have increased 19% on what they averaged last year. Where all other categories increased some, around about 10 to 11%. So they're still on that upward trend. With this graph, and I've included some Western Australian information uh, for anyone in WA who might be logged into the webinar. If you look at this 100% line here, that is the average price for lamb across the year. Now, I've taken these figures back to 2000, so we're looking at 16, 17 years of, of information. The only year when we don't see this general trend in lamb price across the year um, was 2011 when um, we had record prices earlier in the year and then it dropped away leading into our historically high price period of sort of winter. What I just want to show you in the eastern states, um, the price peak and price trough, there's about a 20% difference in average land price. In Western Australia, there's up to a 35% difference in average land price. So if, for example, in Western Australia, you were looking to buy lambs in that June, July period, just prior to the peak, and sell them six to eight weeks later, you're on a downward trend, a well and truly downward trend. So we've got to take that sort of thing into account, and you can use these sort of figures if we haven't got contract prices. If we can work out what the average price for 2017 is likely to be, we can then use these figures for plus and minus above that price to say, okay, generally this is the ballpark figure that we're likely to get when we sell our lambs. Profit margins, as you'd appreciate, are variable and are generally low when feedlotting, and it's due mainly to the high store lamb prices nationally. I've generally felt that profit margins are somewhere around six to eight dollars a lamb um, prior to the real sort of peaking in these store lamb prices, admittedly, but which is pretty much our skin values. The big advantage, and a lot of people have cottoned onto this, and it's some something that you might be able to really look at this year. Uh, with the low grain or damaged grain that'll be available, that value adding that grain by putting it through the lamb is probably the better the better option. So not necessarily making huge profits or large profits in uh, feed lotting, but value adding the grain through the lamb. And I'll show you some of the some of the results from the analysis that we did towards the end of this presentation. Just to give those an idea who may not know what the sheep CRC feedlot calculator is all about. That's just a screenshot of the um, opening page. Um, I will provide uh, Home Sacket MLA. They'll have uh, a copy of the calculator on their website um, after the presentation, sometime tonight or early tomorrow. I'm more than happy if you want to have a run through um, on how to use it. If you want to give me a ring, that's no worries at all. This is uh, the opening page. If you look here, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I've done an analysis looking at terminal merinos, 500 lambs, 38 kilo live weight, around about a 17 kilo carcass, bad at $120 uh, landed. Um, and we're taking them to 50 kilos, which will dress out around about uh, 23 kilos carcass weight. A $6.05 uh, carcass weight here and a $10 skin price. Oh, sorry. Um, which comes up with about $152. So you've got around about $32 there to play with. And you now that's tight, that's really tight. This is that 280 grams today. They're eating about 3.5% of their live weight a day, which then generates in this table to the right hand side, I'll tell you how much on average the lambs will eat um, across the, the period, the total number of feed, both on a dry matter and an as fed base the change in live weight and the number of days on feed based on this growth rate and, and their intake. 
This ration summary here gives us an idea of the actual cost of the ration as fed and on a dry matter base. It tabulates and works out from the information we have in the calculator or you can put in the calculator the energy and protein um, of the ration and that's a fairly balanced ration. Um, and it also gives you an estimate of your calcium to phosphorus ratio based on default values in a lot of the feeds that we have in the calculator. Uh, that's important because uh, we need to have one and a half to two calcium to every one phosphorus in the ration to try and minimise the risk of water belly or bladder stones. <clears throat> Just looking, this is another table that's on that page. We're looking here for the run that I did with barley at $150 a tonne and the total cost of the ration was $278 per tonne when I took into account the lupins at $310 and uh, cereal hay at $120. And if you look in the top right here, the cost, purchase cost overall of, of those lambs, that's 79% of the total cost of producing of, of finishing those lambs, where the ration cost at $14.30 is only 9%. So that's what I'm saying, that the store lamb value is, is the big killer. If we then look at, okay, the, one of the runs where the barley was valued at $300 a tonne and the ration was $278 a tonne, the store lamb as a percentage of total cost is still very high. Our feed costs have come up a bit, but it's not huge. So what I'm saying, if you want to use additives that add extra costs to your ration, other than just, say, lime and salt, you can do so without having a big impact on your um, ration cost. The analysis I've, I've done over the last five, 10 years or so, and this is a general rule of thumb that I use. Store lamb values need to be trading near to 85% relative to your trade lamb values to minimise risk and provide the opportunity for reasonable profit margins. I'll just walk you through how we calculate this. <clears throat> um, this first up, sorry, this is a, from 2012 to current prices, looking at these store lamb values relative to the trade values going across the year. You look here in, in the eastern states and we're trading about 100%, so on par or parity with the um, trade lamb values. And WA, by all accounts, it should be doing a little bit better than us because their store lamb value over there is relatively lower compared to their trade lambs across the year, average across the year. So how do we work it out? We have 17 kilo or 38 kilo live store lamb and we're taking them to 23 kilo trade lamb. Let's say they're $110 landed and $155 when we sell. $110 divided by 17 is 647 cents per kilo. That includes the skin value. $155 for your trade lamb, 23 kilos, that's 674 cents. You divide the 647 by the 674, and that gives us what I call a relativity of 96%. Now, the figure I mentioned that I think we should be trading at is somewhere around 85% to actually make I have a fair chance of making a reasonable margin profit-wise. Another view on that, this is uh, the current data that I use, some of the current data I used. We have store lamb values, eastern states, trade lambs, heavy lambs, and this store relative to the trade value. Here we have an 85% uh, relativity. Working that out, that was back on the 7th of July. Um, Store lambs were $5.28 a kilo. Six weeks later, when we would have put them in a feedlot, turn them off as trade lambs, we got $6.20 a kilo. That is an 85% relativity. The big worry here, and this is where it is very bearable between, between sales, between weeks, but we've had a huge increase here in, uh, in our store lamb values and what a 13 cent increase there in the, in the trade land values, and all of a sudden we've jumped up to 111% relativity. This is a graph showing the relativities in eastern states going back to 1998. You can see by the line, trend line here, that it's just going north. We've had periods when it's been down around this 85% that I was talking about, but we are now approaching the same period as we were in 2011 and it's up around that 110%. So the relative value of the, tri of the store land to the trade is just going through the roof. 
All right, the analysis outcomes. This is store lamp starting at $120, finishing and sold at $152, which worked back at $6.05 hot standard carcass weight plus a $10 skin. On the left hand column here, we have ration cost, $173. That's when barley was $150. All those figures in red for profit, value adding, and return on investment are all in the negative. Pretty sobering stuff. So we've had a $32 difference between store lambs and the trade lamb value, and we're not looking at making a margin at all. The relativity of that store to trade lamb, that 120 to 152 is 107%. If we look at trade lambs going up to $162 or $6.50 carcass plus skin, at the lower values, Grain values here, 150, $180 a tonne. We are making a slight profit and we're value adding by putting that grain through the lamb. And we've got a little slight, or at least not negative, return on investment. Again, if you look at the percentage of the total cost that store lambs represent, they're huge compared to your feed costs. The relative in this case was parity, one on one. If we then look and say, okay, you buy store lambs for 120 bucks and you sell them for 175, but that is seven dollars plus a ten dollar skin, and that's record territory for trade lambs. Yeah, you're looking well and truly. All these blue figures here, you're looking at making reasonable to good profit. Value adding, you're doing very well, and your return on investment is approaching the sort of levels that you'd like to see. Relatively, in this case, was 93 percent. So not down to that 85%, but getting down below that 100% or so. Again, we are sitting somewhere around 110% at the moment. So just wrapping that up, we haven't actually um, covered genetics, but it's an area that uh, I think we need to look seriously at, not just in the crossbreed lambs, but in the merinos as well. There's been some very good work done by Dr. Mark Ferguson showing that if you select size on post weaning weight, you will get additional growth rate in, in their lambs. Dr. Nick Linden from Victorian Department also did some work looking at the different growth rate of sires and the feed conversion efficiency of their lambs, and it is linked. So you push for growth rate, you will actually improve feed conversion efficiencies. All that helps in a lamb feedlot. Importantly, pre-train your lambs to grain and the feeder types being used prior to weaning. It's very, very good trial work that shows that if you pre-train those lambs, if you background those lambs while on the ewes prior to weaning, introduce them to a variety of grains or feeder types and that sort of thing, that they have a lifetime recognition. And with the, the um, interest in buying lambs and finishing lambs, that's going to grow more and more that people will start looking seriously at both the genetics and the backgrounding of the lambs that they're looking to purchase. Minimise your acidosis or your grain poisoning risk. It's one of the biggest health issues, if not the biggest, in a feedlot. Provide a balanced ration. My general rule of thumb is whatever your energy content of your ration is, add two to three, and that will be your protein requirement. So, for example, if, if you've got a ration that's got 12 megajoules of energy, you need 14 to 15% protein. And importantly, and it's a bugbear of mine, these systems that do not include roughage, I always include 10 to 15% effective fibre in the diet. You can get away with using straw, right? As long as that first two weeks, you actually use reasonable quality hay or, or silage to actually introduce and quieten those lambs down. They really just need that roughage component to stimulate the, the digestive system, keep the room in working properly. Social stress, another big issue that I'm very big on. The introduction period. Uh, we've got to introduce these lands. It's, it's a stressful time for them. We've got to try and reduce that stress impact. Space. Uh, industry recommendation is five square metres of land. Let's give them 20 square metres of land. Give them a chance to get away from the bullies and the like. Right? Um, I've got there in brackets the pen, talking about pen size and, and number of lambs. Troughs. You know, going to a feed trough, whether it's an open feed trough, bucket type trough or a self-feeder, is a stressful time. If you're using self-feeders, spread them out. 
And importantly, do your sums. I, I love the principle of, of feedlotting lambs. Um, I think it is a great opportunity to actually provide fantastic product. But hopefully, as I've, I've shown you, it is tight. It is very tight. And it's not necessarily the high grain prices that we're going to see or, or we are currently seeing, but it's that store lamb value. And there's nothing much we can do about that in, in the short term. That um, We've just got so much interest in, in the lamb job. It is doing so well. And um, it, by all accounts, will continue for the next three to five years. We can't see it stopping. And uh, our biggest issue is probably lack of lambs. So to be honest, I generally recommend people, if you can, if you haven't got the opportunity, the paddock feed or, or, or finishing in a feedlot, if you haven't got that opportunity, just breed the little buggers, get them on the ground, sell them on to someone else. I was talking to Dave just before we come on air and we were talking about the opportunity cost of finishing your own lambs. If you, we look at, say, uh, it costs you $3.80 a kilo uh, for a seven, to get a lamb up to 17 kilo carcass weight, that's around $65 for a crossbreed lamb. If you can sell him for $110, $120, you're making $40 to $50 profit and someone else is taking the risk to actually take him to a heavier weight. You will not make those sort of profits in a feedlot situation. So if you have lambs and you've got the opportunity to actually sell them as stores and the prices are looking okay, I'd, I'd certainly look at that. Um, we'd have to look seriously at what our trade land prices are going to be like in the next two to three months because honestly, there's probably going to be a lot of lambs around available, a lot of unfinished lambs, well-finished lambs will demand a good price, but are we going to see trade land prices approaching seven bucks a kilo? Yeah, I have my doubts. With that, I might put it back to you, please, Dave, and we'll have some questions. Thank you, Jeff. That was excellent. A very, uh, very quick and concise, but uh, immensely thorough uh, webinar. And um, I can see that you've put a lot of work into the modelling and you have a, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of pedigree in that space. So thank you for that, Jeff. Very much appreciated on behalf of, uh, behalf of me and, and the audience. Now, Jeff, cool. I'm, I'm just going give to you, give you a minute to break there, if that's all right. There's a few questions coming through, which is really good to see. Um, we've had a great roll up tonight. We've had well over 100 attendees, which um, which I, I which I had actually expected because I think it's a great topic and and um, delivered by a great presenter. Now, uh, Biff, uh, now Jeff has um, kindly offered to stay in line as long as we need him to to uh, go through all the questions and answers that the audience may have. Before we get to those questions and answers, I appreciate that some people tonight, um, you know, may have got a lot from the webinar and, and need to move on to other things. Now, you're welcome to um, quit the webinar now and, and uh, shuffle off if you wish. Now, there's going to be a survey that pops up either when you shut the webinar screen or if you go through to the end of the question time when I shut the webinar down. If you could take five minutes or even just two minutes just to pop your thoughts in that survey, we provide the feedback uh, to, to Jeff, uh, obviously without contact details, but just so Jeff can get an idea of of what the uh, what the audience is, is thinking and how they appreciated his webinar for his future presentations. And we also provide that information to MLA so they can gauge the effectiveness uh, of their extension activities. Now, if you want to leave any constructive criticism or praise, please do so there. Don't forget next week, Bruce Allworth on Thursday, going to be addressing the uh, issue of shearing lambs for increased growth rates. Is it worth it? Is it not? Should we be doing it? Do the costs outweigh or do the benefits outweigh the costs? Now, Jeff, there's a few really good questions coming through here tonight. I've, I might even have one myself, but I'll definitely uh, lead with one from the audience. How, how are you feeling there? Sorry? How are you going there, Jeff? You ready to go? Yeah, yeah, let's hit. Let's go. Awesome. Right out. Jeff, there's a question here from Ross. Uh, I think it's a good question. Ross just asked, uh, when you're talking about valuating the grain, could you just flesh out exactly what you mean there? Yep. With the calculator, it takes into account um, the starting values that we put in um, and it calculates through the lamb. I, I should have checked this up beforehand. It's been a few years since I did the calculator, but um, it, it uh, 
gives it a, yeah, a value add what what um, what it increases if you like the value of that component too. Um, I will say I should have mentioned sorry in the calculator uh, in a lot of squares uh, on the top right hand corner there's a flag. You put your cursor on that, it'll give you background information on um, on things like value adding, uh, which I should have checked up. Sorry, um, on how we actually calculate it, but and also any cell that's yellow, um, you can change the values in. Okay, so sorry about that. I should have checked up um, how we calculated value adding, but again, I haven't done it for a couple of years. I haven't looked at it. No worries, yeah, that's fine. But um, yeah, I'd like to encourage the audience to jump on and and grab that calculator and have a crack at it. You might even be able to let us know exactly where they'll find it, I suspect, on the Sheep's RC website, Jeff. Yeah, we've had problems ever since we've had it on the web, though, unfortunately, um, and it is a slightly older version that's on the Sheep's RC website, and we've had a lot of problems over the years with people downloading it. Um, as I said, I'll, I'll shoot one through to you, and, and um, yeah, people would can uh, contact you guys to actually get a copy of it, or if they want to contact me, I'm happy to email a copy out. Look, Jeff, no worries. I think the, the former would be fine. If you send it to me, I'll I'll be able to distribute it to all of tonight's attendees. Cool. Uh, yeah, got some really good questions coming through here. Um, now, Jeff, there's a question here from Scott. Scott asks, are you able to please explain the calcium to phosphorus ratio again and its importance yep. in the feed lotting? Yeah, cool. Um, we have default values in the list of feeds that we have uh, in the in the calculator and, and I didn't really have time to sort of run through and show people how they can enter additional feeds and the like but we have most feeds, additives, you know, hay grains, all that sort of stuff listed on a feed tables page um, and there are default values in behind that uh, from analysis of those grains that gives us a calcium phosphorus balance um, or rate it then calculates, depending on, on the feed that we have put into the ration, what the calcium phosphorus balance is. As I mentioned, we, we, we target a one and a half calcium to one phosphorus. Calcium is needed for a number of, of functions. Um, cereal grains are low in calcium. Okay, so most of our um, feeds are low in calcium relative to phosphorus. So we need to look at using something like lime or actually acid buff, which is a seaweed extract, which most pellet manufacturers and a lot of producers now use. Uh, just quickly on acid buff, uh, I think it's a fantastic product. Um, costs around $1,100, $1,200 a tonne, but it will replace any lime that you need to put in. Um, it has additional magnesium in it, which is a very good mineral for, uh, for nerves, nerve function and the like, um, which will help um, quieten lambs down. Um, so it releases calcium and magnesium. It's four times the buffer that bicarb of soda is, and bicarb costs around seven or eight hundred dollars a ton anyway. Um, and it buffers for longer in the room, and so it's a very good uh, additive for um, preventing or managing acidosis risk. Um, so the calcium phosphorus balance, yeah, it's just a, a check there in the front page of the calculator to see, okay, do I need to add additional lime or calcium source of some some type? So. Um, and as I said, calcium is needed for muscle contraction. If, if you've grazed cereals at times um, or had lambs that look very stiff, gated and the like in a feedlot, more often than not, it's going to be a calcium deficiency because of um, problems with muscle contraction. Um, the other big one is though, and particularly for long-term feeding, which a lot of lambs would have been on given the season we've had in the Eastern States, uh, except Victoria and, and parts of South Australia, but uh, if they've been fed grain for a long periods and haven't had the supplemental calcium, um, they're, they're at higher risk of having a, a deficiency when they enter a feedlot. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Jeff, a uh, question here from Steve. Steve asks, hello, Jeff. Are you recommending the space of 20 square metres per head during the total time the lamb is in the feedlot? There hasn't really been a lot of work done on space allocation. Um, the work that the industry recommendation of five square metres comes out of uh, with some work done on the live sheep facilities. Um, because I'm so big on social stress and it doesn't cost that much to actually give them a bit more area, yeah, I'd prefer to give them a bit more. 
I also like to give them something to play with, whether it's logs or tyres or something they can climb on and do something with. Um, there are systems out there that actually recommend two to three square metres of lamb. I'm not a big fan of that because of the social stress impact. Those systems and other systems also recommend drafting lambs uh, and putting them into like weight ranges um, periodically. I'm not a big fan of that. You know, sheep are very social animals, but they do have a pecking order. And that's just a stress impact. Um, so on the 20 square metres, if you can afford to do it, I think it's a positive. During wet weather, you're not going to bog up as much um, and you're not going to have as many issues with, uh, with or effluent and, and odour. Um, not that lamb feedlots have anywhere near those issues compared to cattle feedlots. Um, and yeah, to be honest, my feelings are really well based on, on um, social stress issues. Right, thanks Jeff. Jeff, uh, and more, just a comment from, uh, from a participant here, a very sobering presentation. So I think some of your work um, has hit home with, with them. Now I've got a, I suppose that leads me to ask, Jeff, before these questions run away on us. Um, now I've got a rough idea myself, but if you talk about the store lamb, purchasing store lamb and then taking him through, now that's, it's, it's the same when you're considering you have your own store lambs, isn't it? You, you, you conduct the trade in the very same way, don't you? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it's, it's a matter of looking. I, I know producers, and, and credit to them, if they want to finish lambs, sell them to the sale yards or over the hooks and you know do a good job on the lambs, it's a credit. And our industry has become that professional over the years. But um, when it comes down to the nitty gritty and you know, the, the cost benefit of the whole thing, um, you know, a lot of times you're going to be better off selling those uh, those stores. And and again, the opportunity cost of doing that, and you, know, you, you will generally, if not 99% of the time, make more of a margin by selling your lambs and uh, the margin you'll make between what it costs you to actually produce them to that weight and what you actually receive, given the high prices for store lamb, um, yeah, you're going to make more of a margin that way than actually trying to finish them most times. Yeah, right, yeah, thank you. And just to follow on from that, now that um, trade lamb, uh, store to trade lamb price ratio, the uh, your recommendation of I think it was 85% of the uh, trade lamb price, now that's strictly on uh, per kilo dressed weight, exclusive of skins, is it, or inclusive? Um, no, to be inclusive of skins, so the total lamb, lamb value, um, landed lamb value divided by its carcass weight. Yeah, so yeah, the carcass weight, but that total value it includes your skin value. Yeah, right, yeah, perfect. Thank you. No, that's really good. Oh, okay. It's uh, question here from from Ken. Ken asks, "Hi Jeff, what about putting grain feeders out in the paddock with a decent pasture in it?" Yeah, way to go, way to go. We talked about that today, Dave. You are always going to be more profitable doing that. You may not necessarily get as as good a growth rates. Um, but there is a, there are less cost involved with that whole scenario. So uh, if you do have a pasture base, um, reasonable quality or even stubbles if, you, if we get to that, you know, obviously the first couple of weeks you're going to have a bit of green pick and spilt grain and the like, but after that you'll have to look seriously at the, the quality of the feed that's out there. But really supplementary feeding is, is probably more likely to give you a larger margin um, than putting them in a feedlot. Because you do, you do, you reduce a lot of your operating costs. So one thing I didn't mention, Dave, is I didn't include, and there is the option there in the calculator, I didn't include depreciation on capital. Um, I've recently done a big analysis for Western Australian Department of Ag looking at a range of feedlot sizes from three to 5,000 up to 50,000. And scale will certainly reduce the cost of, uh, per lamb, if you like, to cover your depreciation costs. But, um, that can be pretty high and luckily most producers have the infrastructure already. Most people have feeders and the like and they can set up a feedlot you know, close by to the yards where they have handling facilities and you know a couple acre paddocks that they can subdivide. So they can do it reasonably cheap but that's one thing also to bear in mind is that the, the, um, the cost of depreciation on your materials. Right, yeah, perfect, thank you Jeff. Jeff, question here. From Scott, Scott asks Jeff, uh, if you have a 35 kilogram store sucker, is it worth selling the lamb to a feeder with the skin on or the skin off? 
is it more favourable to the buyer or seller if the sheep are in good conditions, score two conditions? So I think there's two questions there. Skin on or yeah. skin off, and if it, are they more valuable if they're um, or more favourable if they're good, score two condition? Yeah, well, it'll be interesting to see what Bruce goes, goes with next week because, um, to be honest, all the trial work that's been done shows that if you shear a lamb or shear a sheep, um, they actually you know, they do nothing for the first couple of weeks. Um, their feed conversion efficiency actually drops away. Uh, and I guess it's all stress. You know, they're all feed for a day or two off water a lot of the times and the whole shearing process. And, and, um, and yeah, they don't necessarily – they will pick up. We do know that. Every producer will tell you they shear a lamb and, and he picks up, and, but it just takes a little bit of time. With respect to skin values, and this is something where the merino really comes in, um, I've been tracking the, the skin values for the last 10, 15 years as well, and, and uh, as people would know, know, the sucker lamb skins are nowhere near what we used to get. You know, you're probably looking 10 to $12 for the lambs, but it's interesting that, um, and ideally, you know, you're looking probably one and a half to two inch minimum when you sell the lambs. Below that, the prices tend to drop away a bit. But if you look at, uh, this is where the merino really comes into its own. And the only stumbling block with finishing merino lambs at the moment is that we've got a lot of producers retaining the weather portion because of the high wool prices. But if you um, compare the prices of, of a uh, two to three inch merino with a uh, skin to a uh, two to three inch older lamb or sucker lamb skin, there's around about a $20, $25 per head difference which makes up the gap um, well and truly that uh, trade lambs, crossbred lambs versus merino lambs, the gap there. So you're pretty well on par or doing better if you finish merinos. Um, so the, the shearing one, I mean, it's the trial work shows that it's not really that good an opportunity or, or thing to do, but there are situations like this time of year coming into grass seed and the like, a lot of the buyers will be looking for shorn lambs. Um, and, you know, as I said, they tend to do a little bit better um, in time once the wool's off them. One thing to uh, just bear in mind is unlike cattle, sheep regulate most of their body temperature through the mouth and the nose. Okay, wool is a very good insulator for sure, but it only takes about two weeks of regrowth and they don't really feel extremes in temperature. Um, so going into the summer months, you, know, you can knock the wool off, but it's, it's really not going to make a, ma a great difference. It, it's the regulation of the temperature through the nose and the like. So quality water, you know, potentially shade um, and the like. Everyone would have noticed lambs and sheep and the like in the middle of a paddock. Or they're um, standing next to their neighbour, which I can't think of anything worse to do on a stinking hot day, but standing next to a, a sheep next to them with the head down in the shade of that sheep. And that's to cool those nose, that nasal passage. So... Um, on the wool side, yep, it really depends on what's happening with the skin bees and that does change over time for sure. But I would recommend if you are going to shear the lambs and looking at selling them in six to eight weeks' time that you have a minimum of one and a half to two inches on that pelt. Um, sorry, what was our second part of that question, Dave? Um, the second part of the question was if the, uh, if the sheep are in condition score two. Right. If you know, I suppose asking whether um, if there, if condition score two is a um, a good marketing, you know, a good uh, good place to be in the market for store lambs. Yeah. Well, I guess so, and it's interesting that the, that they said condition score because eastern states we've always pretty well worked on fat score, and to be honest, since I left the department and run the lifetime year groups, there are just so many benefits in talking about condition score because we can actually feel how fleshed out that lamb is. It's not just the fat cover, but how whether that lamb is going forward or not, depending on how fleshed out that eye muscle is. Um, condition score two to two and a half would probably be a minimum. Uh, otherwise, I think the lambs have done it hard and they're going to be struggling to sort of get up to weight. Um, and it may take a little bit longer, whether it's on a pasture-based system or in a feedlot. Um, whether or not you take the risk and go direct to sale yards or you put them on the box uh, on, on Auctions Plus. It's probably one of the better options um, going Auctions Plus because they'll stay on farm if you don't don't receive uh, your minimum. So I'd say condition score two, two and a half would actually be a minimum that I'd like to see the lambs um, if, if a finisher were going to buy them. Right, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, here's a good one for you, Jeff. Um, a bit, uh, I don't know if there's anything righty on it, but uh, here we go. Uh, Jeff, Jeff, another Jeff says, I have lambs, grain, loosen. What, man what management would you suggest to put this together? <laughs> okay. Um, do we know where about this other Jeff's from? Is he southern New South Wales at the moment or? Oh, I, that I, I, I just don't. I just don't know. I just don't know. No, no doubt he's typing in okay. the questions box, but if I get a reply from him, I'll let you know. Yeah, all right. Look, just a couple of things. If you're looking at just grazing loosen first and foremost, the first thing that sheep and lambs will do when they graze loosen is eat everything else out of the paddock. People that have loosen, grab loosen next time you're in the paddock and have a taste of it. It is bitter. So they will do well on it in time. Lucent is not that high in energy. It's probably only around about 10 megajoules. Um, it's pretty good for protein. So um, the biggest issue would be getting them to eat the grain out of self-feeders at the time. So um, again, if you could pre... Just interrupting, sorry. Jeff is in southern New South Wales. Uh-huh. All right. So look, supplementary feeding on lucent. Uh, a couple of things that I'd probably look at is You've got to be a little bit careful if it's very fresh, if you've got a flush of loosen, flush of growth, because red gut can be a big issue. Um, if it is um, fresh loosen, we need to keep the effective fibre levels up. Now, you can do that by feeding something like oats, but you'll tend to lose a little bit on your energy side. Um, again, I'd have roughage out. I'd have roughage out. With loosen as well, uh, not to get too technical, but it's very high in potassium, and potassium tends to bind up magnesium. And so we may well end up with a magnesium deficiency. So I'd be looking at supplementing with a magnesium source, something like Cosmag um, or, again, acid buff, um, dolomite. Um, but be careful with the, the dolomites that are out there. Um, mudgy dolomite, I know, is quite good, quite well balanced for both the calcium and the magnesium content. Some dolomites uh, are really no different to most limes where they have very little magnesium. But... Yeah, in that situation, by all means, I'd have self-feeders out. Barley is the pick of cereal grains. Um, it's not as dangerous. It's not as high in starch as our wheat and triticales. It's a little bit higher in fibre. It's a little bit higher in oil. It's got good energy. It's got good protein. It's palatable. It's got a good mix of vitamins and minerals. So uh, barley would be my choice if you're going with cereal grains. You're not going to lose at the moment, though, um, by using pulses. If you look at the price of our pulses, our lupins, faber beans, peas, they're pretty well on par with most higher-grade varieties of, of cereal grains, and they are safer. Lupins has got less than 10% start, so we don't see grain poisoning or acidosis on lupins. But just a word of warning with faber beans and peas and the like, A, if the lambs haven't seen them before, you might, might be a while before you can get them onto it, and B, be careful if you crack them because that opens up um, the, the grain to, or uh, well, the starch component of the grain, bigger surface area, the bugs can attack that. Most peas, and, most peas and beans have around about the same starch level as oats, so they are reasonably safe, but they can be a risk. So I'd look at supplementing on the loosen situation. I'd have loose licks out or in with the grain. One way of actually... Doing it is to actually mix your loose slick up, your lime or your dolomite um, and your salt, for example. Mix it up in water, make a slurry out of it, like a, a runny honey. And when you auger out of your uh, silos or into your grouper or your feed bin, um, just pour, pour that mixture in the hopper as it's going up the grain. It'll coat the grain. It won't settle out in your feeders like it does if you put it in dry. Um, and anything that eats the grain will then get that supplement, that additive. Alternatively, put loose licks out, make up loose licks, buy loose licks, whichever way you want to go. Just be wary that most sheep, or not all sheep, will actually go to those licks. Um, some will get more than they need, some won't get enough. Perfect. Thanks, Jeff. Back to you. Um, Jeff, quick question here um, from Scott. Uh, Scott asks, what's the ratio of salt and lime per tonne of grain? Yep. Can vary a bit between, depending on the grains, but generally we look at around about 1.5% on a weight base. So looking at about 15 kilos of both salt and lime um, per tonne of grain. Yeah, right, yeah. Spot on. Thank you. Now, um, uh, Robbie, Robbie asks, 
you've covered grain feeding. Um, how do you think forage crops such as brassica and lucerne stack up against grain? Well, you've probably covered a bit of that, but uh, any other comments yep. on that? Listen, and, and it's something to be wary of with uh, the way the season's gone in most of eastern Australia with failed canola crops is a, or brassic is there, there are potentially a huge amount of health issues that um, we can run into. Um, photosensitivity is one of them, nitrate poisoning. Um, they can be a reasonably good, uh, if they're a failed crop, they can be a reasonably good sort of stopgap and you can actually graze them. With the brassicas, um, to be honest, to get most benefits out of those, you probably need to look at the... Um, strip grazing them um, because you'll find particularly in some of the summer forages our sorghums and the like are not necessarily great sheep feed they're more a cattle feed i prefer the millets um, and because you'll find with brassicas or those thick crops summer forages that they'll work their way into it they won't graze across the paddock so they'll flog out a corner more than likely around the watering points and just work their way through um, now sheep prefer four to six inch of um, feed for a maximum Getting above that, you start to get into cattle feed. Um, brassicas and the like, also be wary that they're very high in moisture. So again, I'd have uh, some effective fibre out there, whether it's grain or um, or some sort of hay or block available as well. Um, but just be a little bit wary of some of the potential health costs. Um, you will find, and um, again, with your, your cost of pasture establishment, even with something like a brassica, is going, going to be less than your cost of grain and running through a feedlot. It's always going to be cheaper to actually put them on a pasture base. But I think the combination of the pasture, um, some grain, a few extra additives, vitamins and minerals, depending on the, the type of feed that they're on, and some roughage. Um, and that's the, that's the best option. Thanks for that. Um, now, A question here, Jeff, have, is taking lambs through to export weights an option that you've modelled? All right, good question. But I'm hard on export weights, have been for 10 years or better. If you look at the average, and it's tightened up admittedly in the last couple of years, but um, if we look back, and I'll just look back on my printed copy here, the export average Heavy lamb last year, uh, this year was $6.20 and trade lambs are $6.24. So that gap has tightened up, but for years it was between 10 to 12 cents less for an export lamb. Now I fully understand that with processors because they're gonna have more waste when it comes to trimming off the fat and the like from those heavier lambs. But they're on your property for longer. Yes, you do get more per head because the lambs are heavier, but you're running them through, if you are a breeder, if you turn those lambs off at 22, 23 kilos, you have both domestic and export works buying for that lamb. If you take them through to 26 or 28 kilos, we no longer want anything really heavier than that. If you take them through to that, they're on your property for another two or three months. They're eating feed that your ewes could be using to get in back in better condition to give you your next crop of lambs. All right, so I always would like to target that 22, 23 kilo. I guess the other thing too, and it comes down to the genetics and how we've changed the shape of our lamb, is that we put a lot of emphasis on growth rate, length, and height and size. And you now we are, we are getting to a stage really where it's quite difficult to finish our big export lambs. It takes them longer. Yes, they grow faster, but it takes them longer to actually flesh out, right, and produce a good carcass. Dr. Mark Ferguson has recently been in the press saying. Now the future for lamb production or sheep production is basically a brick, and I'm all for that. We have got too big um, in a lot of our breeds, and it, it is just making it harder and harder to finish those lambs, unfortunately, because you've got to take them to those heavier weights a lot of times to actually have them flesh out and produce a nice, well-muscled carcass. And I think we'll see the change in the industry. Um, all credit to MLA and the like, when we first really dug in and started to build our export market, it was all based on the um, fresh Australian range lamb programs into America. And America's, Americans generally have those super heavy lambs, you know, but they also get subsidised a lot to actually produce those lambs, but they can't sell their own lambs over there. So why are we producing, or why were we targeting those really heavy exports? Ideally, 23 kilos. Right out, perfect. Thanks, Jeff. Now, Jeff, um, 
We've still got a few questions rolling in here, which is really good. It's a sign that everyone's pretty engaged and interested in the topic. Um, now, there's a question here. Um, a good question from uh, from Brett in Victoria. Brett asks, uh, what proportion of barley to lupins do you generally recommend in your feedlot ration? Yep. Barley to lupins. The one, yep. The one I used in the um, analysis we've just gone through was around 70% barley and I think 15% lupins. It may not have been that high, but um, you don't lose with energy when you put lupins in, so that's great. It might even bump our energy content up a little bit because the lupins will generally be around about 13, 13 and a half megajoules per kilogram. Um, but we benefit depending on the type of lupin that you, uh, sorry, lupin that you're using um, on the protein component, and that really bumps up that up that protein. So you don't need a lot. Um, just be a little bit wary um, of feeding too much of those high protein feeds, um, and I guess the same even if you're including some of our meals, cotton seed, canola meal and the like, um, is that you can have an overload of nitrogen in the system um, or ammonia in the system. So be a little bit careful, don't go too high. You don't need to. Um, you know, 20, 25% maximum is all you really need for any of the pulses. Righto, um, so some people, uh, there's been some people say thank you very much uh, for a great webinar and um, some people are happy to have the calculator emailed to them, so I'll definitely crack on and do that in the next day or two. Um, uh, a question here from Neil. Neil asks, how important is water, um, uh, you know, e.g. groundwater with some salinity versus fresh water? Will it make any difference in the feedlot situation? <clears throat> it, it certainly can. Um... I can relate to a trial I did when I was still in the department and I had water meters on the um, actual feedlot in the feedlot trial and we were water uh, and these lambs had actually come off the salt bush trial that I'd had. Um, so they were, they were the lighter lambs. Um, they come onto the department and I didn't think to test water quality and those lambs only drank around about the two trial groups drank about 450 mils a day on average and 750 mils a day. Now generally we say that a lamb will drink around two and a half times what he eats a day. So if he's eating round figure, say a kilo of, of grain and roughage, he should drink around two and a half litres. Summertime, we're probably looking five to six litres a day. Um, if they're home bred lambs and same water source, they shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't have any worries. It can be an issue when you're buying in, uh, bringing in lambs um, from elsewhere. Um, I can relate to one producer years ago that used to buy a lot of Western lambs that had never seen a water trough. He had to let his lambs, those lines of lambs, out of the feedlot um, and put them on a dam uh, because they hadn't seen a trough in the like before. On the water quality side, it's, a, it's an area that we can do more work with, but um, I like the idea of actually, if you can have a recirculation system or running water, um, if you think of Pavlov's dogs, if it just stimulates them, um, the people that use the PVC water troughs, I'm still not convinced they are the best way to go, but benefits with those um, PVC pipe troughing, um, basically be low volumes of water. As soon as it's disturbed, you have that running water sound. Uh, disadvantages of those systems, low volume of water, potentially contaminants from grain and roughage that are around the lamb's mouth that are dropped in the water trough can increase um, problems with quality. Um, so it's critical in those lower volume sort of water troughs to actually flush those systems fairly regularly. During the dry, I fully understand you don't want to waste water. Um, I'd always like to see, uh, you know, lambs on, on water troughs more so than dams um, because of the potential issues with boggy, bogging and, and poor water quality. Um, it's a means of actually getting it tested. And if you can do something about it, if, if the salinity is not too high or if you might have some other issues you can actually correct, um, yeah, by all means do so. Water is critical. We haven't done enough work on it, to be honest, but if they don't drink, you don't have the gut flow, they just don't, um, don't do as well. Perfect. Thanks, Jeff. Jeff, um, Charles asks here, do high wool prices provide a good opportunity to improve margins with merino lambs? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, 
as I said, just looking at the, tracking the prices of two to three inch skin merino lambs versus sucker and older lamb skins, and there's about a twenty five dollar head difference. Now I know a lot of producers wouldn't actually sell uh, or, or have lambs on the market they could buy with two to three inch skin because most people would have um, shorn them. But um, and if you're doing your own lambs, I guess I question whether or not you, if you shear the lambs, the merino lambs, put them into a feedlot. Do you attribute the returns on the wool to the feedlot system or your whole farm system? And I, I tend to think you should do it for the whole farm. But um, I think the merino is sitting pretty at the moment. Um, if I can just, I might go to one of the supplemental slides, Dave, just quickly. Is it? That's fine, Jeff, go for it. I know. Now I can't move my screen, so you might need to put it back to me, but um, I'll, I'll talk through it. If you look at the merino lambs, or can you slip it back to me for a second? Well, it is still with you, Jeff. Just click on the, maybe click on, on the screen first and then try and move it. Um, All uh, right, okay, yep, it's working. Here we go. If we look at this one, okay, so this is the graph, similar graph that I showed earlier with Eastern States and WA lamb price patterns. Okay, where again, 100% is, is the average price across the year. If you look at your, um, oh, sorry. If you look at the red line, that's uh, Merino lamb for the last four years. Oh, sorry. And the blue line is, is our trade lands. We have a bit of a price peak around March or so for the trade lands, and that's basically because we come into Easter and there's a bit of demand, particularly six or eight weeks out, which is the time that it takes to uh, get a lot of our lamb on boats and overseas. But if you look at the uh, Merino, it peaks earlier in that winter period price-wise than the trade lambs. It then, when we start to get our sucker lambs hitting the system in spring, drops away a lot quicker. So there's a great opportunity for finishing merino lambs because you've got this price peak here and to be honest I prefer people to take them through to 23, 24 kilos um, because again the merino um, just needs to flesh out that little bit more but you don't tend to have um, the fat fat issues and the like. Um, so if you can shear your lambs, put them in the feedlot, take them through, we won't get the growth rates as we do compared to the crossbred lambs but you've got a great opportunity in that sort of June, July period um, for the merino to really hit its straps. There was some trial work done 10, 15 years ago now at the Department of Ag and Cow, and it was called a genotype trial. They had uh, lambs anywhere from a traditional second cross lambs right down to straight merinos. From that trial, the merinos, and it was back when we had crypt orchids, um, which were basically um, you put the ring on the purse and push the testicles up into the body cavity and should make them um, infertile. That gave an extra 10 to 15% growth rate. It was a fantastic, but unfortunately when we hit the drought, the, the 90s drought, the um, very hard to actually finish those lambs. But from that trial, the merino portion, the straight merinos, yeah, they took six to eight weeks longer to get to a 24 kilo carcass weight than a crossbred lamb, but they only cut $2, sorry, a quarter of a kilo less saleable meat, principally because they weren't as fat so they didn't have that trimming loss. And the merino's come a long way. I mean, we're changing the structure of the merino, making it more of a dual purpose animal, focusing more on the carcass value of the lambs. And the merino's coming into its own. It's not just the skin value. Um, what I'd just like to show you for the merino's, this next slide, if you look at the change since 2010, and it has varied, but this is the difference in carcass weight between merino lambs and trade lambs in Eastern Australia. We are now sitting, you know, we've come down from 63 cents difference back in 2010 and we're sitting somewhere around 45, 46 cents a kilo difference between the merino and the crossbred lamb. And again, with the skin values at the moment, with the wool values and, and, and the skin value you get if you've got a little bit of length on those skins, it really makes up that difference in the carcass values. So I think the merino is, is really the focus, should be the focus for most people. Um, uh, generally, you might get them a bit cheaper, but again, at the moment, merinos are up in price because uh, we are seeing a lot of producers retaining the weather portion that would normally go to slaughter, um, just for that cash flow from the wool, wool sales. Thank you, Jeff. Jeff, I'll just give you a rest there for a second. We've still got probably um, close to 10 or a dozen questions to go here, um, but I just... Mm. Uh, 
want to um, just remind everyone that you know, we are meeting again next Thursday night with uh, Bruce Allworth to talk about shearing lambs. We've touched on that a little bit tonight, but Bruce will be fleshing that out in greater detail. We'll be looking at the biology and the, the costs and the benefits of, of the actual management practice. I think it'll be, it's a timely timely that we addressed it, and especially leading into the grass seed part of the year. Now, don't forget the survey that is going to pop up on your screen when you leave the webinar or when I shut the webinar uh, platform down. We always appreciate you leaving a little bit of feedback on that uh, on that uh, on that survey. Now, don't forget that these webinars are an MLA-funded activity. Um, it's the producer levies that are making it all happen. It's only fair that we get the uh, provide this opportunity to as many producers as we can. So, if you've got friends, family, or local distribution networks, um, please email them the. Um, the registration link to, to jump on board or if you don't have that just be in touch with me and I'll, I'll get it straight to you but definitely worthwhile activity for for everyone out there in, in the in the market right now jeff a few more questions here for you um a quick one here yep. from terry terry asks uh do you have uh, do you recommend using salt blocks in, in the in the feedlot um, salt blocks or some sort of salt for sure because like um, calcium all cereal grains are low in sodium. Um, sodium has a couple of different roles. Primary role is to um, stimulate drinking and keeping the whole gut flow sort of process happening. So yeah, I would I would definitely look at either having the um, the sodium or salt in with your grain um, and as I mentioned before making it up or fine salt making it up as a loose liquid and um, coating the grain so anything that eats a grain actually gets that additive. Okay, thank you Jeff. Jeff, a uh, question here from, from Robbie. Is there any financial benefit to grain feed ewe lambs to increase body weight to meet mating, uh, mating weights? Thanks Robbie. Now I know that's probably a little bit outside of the scope of tonight but if you've got any brief comment on that you're more than welcome to, to contribute now. I think it's a magic question. I really do. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, we've got more and more um, interest in actually mating new lambs. Um, we've got more people looking at eight monthly or accelerated lambing systems with lambing three times in two years and the like. That puts a lot of stress on the system. And it does worry me, to be honest, that uh, particularly, say, the Merino in particular, I mean, it takes time to grow out. And if she is actually pregnant and still trying to grow out, she's still a lamb. Um, let's give it every help we can, every help we can. So I don't think you'll lose. Um, I actually did an analysis here a couple of months ago when barley was trading at $150 a tonne. It was actually profitable then to feed for eight weeks just for wool production alone, right? So you're recouping the cost of your, of your barley just for wool production, and that was at $15 or $15.50 a, um, or $15.50 a kilo for the wool without all the extra added benefits like an increase in body condition. So by all means, yeah, I'd be pushing them. I'd be pushing them, grow them out. We want those ewe lambs, a target would be about 75% of their mature weight, right? Um, so if they say, if your mature weight is 70 kilos, and I'm just doing a quick calculation, you want those ewe lambs up to about 52, 53 kilos. So let's let's push them. Let's push them along with, with grain. Um, Again, cereal grains, high risk, high risk with acidosis and the like. Um, it's probably more of a role for using your pulses that are going to meet the um, protein requirements as well as provide good energy. Right, yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Jeff, a question here from Jim. Uh, when you talk about the difference in cents per kilogram profitability of producers producing a store lamb compared to a trade lamb, have you factored in the cost of running a U in the background to produce the store lambs? That's another great question and it's something again we were talking about today, today Dave, is we have got a lack of information out there on the cost of production. I always ask producers when we run workshops how many people know what it costs them to produce a kilo of meat and it's been very, very few people have actually been able to work it out. It's something we definitely need to look at uh, and cost in because like you prices have gone through the roof as well. Um, and 
my ballpark would be generally around three dollars eighty, four dollars a kilo to get a lamb up without growing a lamb up to that store lamb weight. Um, so it's something that industry needs to look seriously at. Most producers could tell you what it costs them to produce a ton of grain. Some might be able to tell you what it, what it costs to produce a kilo of wool, but very few actually have a handle on their cost of production for meat production. And one of the better drivers of the whole thing is getting more lambs alive and keeping them alive. So like, um, like Robbie mentioned, asked the question earlier about um, pushing the ewe lambs. Uh, yeah, let's, let's get them pregnant. Let's get as many twin lambs as we can. Let's do something about survival of the twin lambs. Um, and it's a win-win. It reduces your cost of production. Perfect. Thank you. Well, for the um, for the audience's um, information, we will be running a webinar a little bit uh, a little bit further down the track, focused on the results of the uh, sixteen seventeen prime lamb performance, uh, uh, you know, benchmarking analysis. And um, there'll be some interesting interesting things that come out of that, in particular around the cost of production for prime lambs, and it's a little bit concerning, but I'll, um, I'll leave it at that as a, as a teaser for, for that webinar when it comes along. Now, Jeff, a question here from uh, from John. From John John asks, is there more benefit of taking your lambs out to heavy weights as opposed to going to trade weight? Now, we may have already answered that, haven't we? Yeah, I think we pretty well covered that. Um, as I said, there are very few, if you look at the periods when heavy lambs, now heavy lambs, according to the NLRS um, report, is now it goes from 24 kilos and up. It used to be 26 kilos and up, so it's traditional export type lamb. But So um, there, there's, there's been very few periods over the last 10 years when you've received more per kilo for those export lambs. As I said earlier, you get more per head because they're heavier, but it's cost you more and as a lamb is maturing and putting fat down, his efficiency is reducing. Okay, so for every kilo he puts through his mouth, he's actually going to give you less in carcass weight. So I would rather see people turn the lambs off unless there was a real glitch in the market and trade lambs at that time. A 23 kilo lamb wasn't making that good a dollar. And if there was the option in holding them on for a little bit longer and making more, um, and I know that's difficult without contracts, but again, if you look at some of the graphs we use here tonight and you look at the seasonal price patterns, you can start to try and pick and work out what you're likely to get in that two, three, four months down the, down the track. But generally, as I said, I'd target a 23 kilo. Um, I think I honestly think you're better off uh, turning lambs off that way. Right, yeah, perfect. Thanks, Jeff. Um, Jeff, just a really quick one. Andrew just asked if you remind us what the name of that calcium supplement you were talking about before, he, he, it might have cost about 1100 bucks yep. a tonne, was it? Yeah, it's called Acid Buff. It's acid a seaweed buff. extract. Yep. It's, it's, uh, as I said, most pellet manufacturers now use it. A lot of producers now use it. Um, yeah, it's, it's the duck's guts when it comes to, to preventing grain poisoning and that sort of thing. And as I said, it also gives you calcium and magnesium um, into the system. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, a question here from Jim. Jim asks, will lambs grow at a faster daily rate if you feed them in troughs compared with thick lick feeders? Yeah, that's that's a difficult one. Um, a lot of it will come down to past experience. Um, trial work that we did in the department when we looked at total mix rations where you had all the roughage combined with the grain versus grain and hay separate, like the grain in self feeders and the hay just available in hay racks. Um, there was really no no great benefit to doing a total mixed ration and to do that you need specialised equipment. You need a Keenan or something similar like that. Then you've got your labour component. Um, I, I guess the main things would be pre-training the lambs to know what a, because they are neophobic, it's a neophobic, they're scared of new things. Pre-train them prior to weaning to the type of feed trough that you'll be using or feeder that you'll be using. Space allocation, um, a lot of people will set up and have single side access so they don't go into the feedlot but they feed from the central lane. Um, industry recommendations is somewhere around 25 to 30 centimetres per lamb. So you need plenty of trough space if it's single sided feed. If it's double sided feed, so the troughs are inside the pens, 
um, you pretty well half that allocation, so somewhere around 15 centimetres. But again, I, I liken it to this social stress issue, and you know, your bullies aren't necessarily the ones that are bunting and pushing and, and fighting with the other lambs. They're the ones that are, are trying to work out where they stand in the social pecking order. The bullies are the ones with the mouth in the trough. All right, so they're the ones that go first and foremost there. There's the shy feeders, and we can have an issue with shy feeders for sure, particularly merinos. Give them as much space allocation as possible. Um, I don't necessarily think that uh, open troughs are better than self feeders. A lot of it's to do with the background of the lamb. Good idea, perfect. Thank you, Jeff. Oh, Jeff, I've, I think I've seen it all now. You wouldn't believe it. We've got uh, we've got a bit of marketing going along in the webinar here. We've got someone with 4,000 4, store composite lambs ready to go, $125 a head. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, more than happy, but as long as you don't tell MLA, then I'm going to be taking the commission on them. <laughs> 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 no, so, um, so, yeah, so if you've got those... Uh, <laughs> People start to think about, you know, specifically about what their store store land values are now, and what they might be able to value add them, which is which is um, a great outcome for attending the webinar. Got people thinking about that. Um, yeah, some really good really good feedback here, Jeff. A few people writing in. I know webinars can be a thankless task because you don't get any feedback from the crowd, but we've got a few people here saying how much they appreciated the webinar and and how worthwhile it was. Um, now, oh, a question here from Paul. Paul asks, uh, just quickly, uh, I think you might be able to interpret the question better than I. What about zeolite or zeolite? Zeolite. Yeah. Yep. Zeolite. Yep. yep, certainly some producers, um, and it's probably something you should use or could use if you have mould and the like, any risk of, of mould in the grain. Um, it tends to deactivate a lot of the mould. So. Um, you can use zeolite um, as a buffer. It's probably not as good as your bicarb and that sort of thing, um, but it doesn't hurt to have that that in there as a as a preventative. Um, again, particularly if you have some sort of mould damage. Farmers, okay. Um, uh, question here: We're running a self-replacing flock of Coopworth ewes, about to shear our lambs and introduce them to feeders now, and target the feedlot as a for a store market, the lambs have 70 millimeter of wool on them. Are we on the right track? But that's from Casey. Now, just before you address that, Jeff, don't forget we are addressing the shearing issue yeah. next week. So, yeah, um, yeah, that's a rock and a hard place. 70 mils. Um, look, honestly, given that I'm not sure what Coopworth wool's actually bringing, and that, that style of wool's bringing, but um, in that, that case, coming into grass seed issue, depending where your case is based, um, coming into the hotter, hotter months and the like, uh, it's probably, yeah, knock, them, knock the wall off. Most, if not all, of your um, professional finishers are going to look for a short wool lamb. Yep, right out. Perfect. Um, there's a question here from Jim about the acid buff composition, cost and where to source, but, Jeff, I think... I might just um, like if you could just say that if it's on Google search and it's a it'd be publicly available information. I it might be best if um, if we just look it up there. Would that be right, Jeff? To be honest, I get the question occasionally, and it's quite difficult. I haven't got a good handle on who's actually stocking it. Um, Food Works initially, um, and they were based at Toowoomba up near where I am at the moment. Uh, they initially were the ones that uh, Feed Works, sorry, not Food Works. That imported it. So if you look up, if you do a search for acid buff, A C I D B U F, um, yeah, you'll probably get onto Feedworks and the like. Um, Ian Sawyer from Victoria is actually uh, one of the better contacts. And yeah, if, if Jim wanted to contact me or anyone wanted some contacts, I'll, I'll try and do something there for sure. Right, yeah, no dramas. Awesome. Now, question here from Kevin. I know Kevin's up. Up, um, up on the slopes of the uh, of the snowy mountains there. So Kevin asks Jeff, how many lambs per grain feeder in a paddock situation? Yep. In a paddock situation? Yep. Okay. Listen, when you, I'm basing this on the Carolic feeder control results they did when they first developed the Carolic feeder, all other feeders will be pretty well the same. 
In a grazing situation, you're probably looking at 250 to 300 head per feeder, the standard eight foot feeder. In a, uh, in a feedlot situation, I wouldn't go past about 110 lambs, maybe 120 maximum. That gives them around about two and a half centimetres access. Um, but the beauty of it in a feedlot, it's, it's available 24 seven. So for your standard 2.4 metre or eight foot feeder, work on about 110, 120 in a feedlot. In a paddock situation, if there is additional feed, um, like some sort of pasture base there, you could probably go up to 250, 300 per feeder. Just a couple of things on them. I like to spread the feeders around, again, to minimise that risk of bullying. I like to put them away from the water uh, the water points. Um, yes, lambs will come in and drink, and the idea about putting our feed or additive supplements, whatever, near the watering troughs is that they have more contact then, but let's make them work the paddock. Um, but just be mindful, depending on the size of the paddock too and your number of watering points, that um, yeah, sheep will walk, they'll walk during the day, but while ever they're doing that, they're walking energy off. If you lock them up into a smaller area or a feedlot, you will save about 10 to 15% of your energy requirement. So that's 10 to 15% of your feed requirement. Okay, so there's, a, there's a, a balance there that you need to sort of look at. So A, I'd be putting feeders in a paddock situation, say 500 metres away from the water troughs. I'd spread them out. Wouldn't necessarily put them under shade. Um, there probably are some advantages of having the uh, having them in shaded areas at times, particularly in the afternoon, because they do heat up. Uh, the, the feeders do heat up. Um, but yeah, 250 to 300 lambs in a standard feeder. Uh, well done, thank you, Jeff. Uh, I've even got a question here, Jeff, for Ross. Um, uh, do you plan on doing something similar with cattle uh, for future seminars or uh, webinars? These uh, lamb ones have been very useful. Ross, great question. Thank you. Now, it's the, um, the, the current uh, scenario is that we have the funding to run um, sheep meat specific webinars from MLA and that's, that's what we're contracted to do at the moment. Now, more than happy to, to, to venture into beef. Um, it's just a matter of convincing MLA that there's a market out there and that'll be well received and, and, and given that it meets their um, you know, policy objectives, then that may be the case. So if anyone wants to, uh, you know, lobby for uh, beef orientated webinars as well, be in touch with me or even better, directly to MLA and um, we can put a bit of pressure on them. So a uh, question here from, um, oh, it's a long question. It's more of a comment. Um, uh, from a from a participant who's really enjoyed tonight's webinar. Uh, he says, thanks, this is from Robbie. Robbie says, uh, interesting to hear you say summer brassicas are cheaper to establish than feeding grain. I have been growing summer brassicas as a pasture renovation program, but now I have run out of crappy pastures to renovate. And now the question, and now the question, financial, and, and now question the financial benefit of brassica. I can see the benefit of selling this, that store lamb. Once again, thank you guys for loving the webinar. So that's, that's from Robbie. So you've got um, Robbie thinking about, um, you know, the, the brassica versus grain versus selling store lamb, which is a great outcome. Um, yeah, with, just, just sorry, Dave, just with the brassicas, I mean, you're looking at a bulk of feed. I'm just relating to some brassicas and canolas, grazing canolas that we looked at with one of my lifetime year groups. And I think from memory there was, we, we did a couple of pasture cuts across the, the paddocks and there was up to 12 or 18 tonnes of dry matter per hectare. And so a lot of it comes down to utilising the best possible by stocking rate. And electric fencing is probably the best way to go and strip graze, but not many people are set up for that sort of thing. So, yeah, look, again, if, if you're not wasting more because lands are trampling and soiling the areas, but they're, they're forced to eat it. Um, yeah, it, it's just cheaper per head. Yeah, and it's a perennial problem, isn't it, with any fodder crops is being able to deal with so much dry matter in such a short period of time and get the feed, load, feed utilization, isn't it? So, yeah, yeah very interesting. Now, um, quick question here from John. John, he's uh, in New South Wales. He's asked how critical 
is good shade uh, for weight gains in the feedlot. Yep, yeah. this is a um, this is an area that I might shock a few people. <clears throat> um, I don't honestly believe, and please don't walk away from here and say Jeff Duddy said don't give him shade, but because of that regulation of body temperature through the nasal passages in the mouth and the importance of quality and cool water, I don't necessarily believe that sheep do any better with shade, except on a stinking hot still day when we have very little airflow and it's, and it's very hot and really humid. I'd always like to see shade. Um, obviously, if you're using trees, you've got to be careful and protect the trees and no one will ever convince me that sheep have got nutritional wisdom and will go and eat a bark of a tree because they're, they're low in zinc or they're low in copper or, or whatever. I think it's more of a boredom thing or a lack of roughage. So by all means, have shade um, there if possible. If you want to put artificial shade up, um, the costings of those can be prohibitive uh, for sure, but I would like to see shade. I don't necessarily believe that they need it, except if it's really hot and humid and no airflow. Yeah, perfect, Jeff. And I might be speaking out of turn here, Jeff, but I, I do recall some research in cattle feedlots and that, um, you know, shade, there was no de demonstrative benefit of of shade in them either and that, yeah, humidity was the biggest killer. But, uh, yeah, very yeah. interesting topic, very interesting topic. A question here from Ken. Ken asked, Jeff, would you use oats and lupins as a feeder ration? No issue at all with that at all. Um, depends on the quality of the oats and the type of oats. Um, Alan Kaiser, who's unfortunately no longer with us, uh, did some good work in the department, New South Wales DPI, looking at digestibility levels of some of the oat varieties, and there's a, quite a good paper on the DPI website with it. Some oat varieties are very low digestible, down to around about 55%. Um, a lot of that's related to their fibre component. Um, oats generally are a safer feed, as I said, but be careful. Don't let them gorge on oats because you can lose lambs on that. It's not acidosis or that acid production that first kills the lamb. It's basically bloat where they can't you know, get rid of the gas and the foam and they blow up. So be careful that they don't because um, you still can have problems with oats. But, um, yeah, by all means, what you'd probably do in that case, Ken, is actually bump your lupin level up a bit. Your oats will probably be, depending on the variety and the quality of them, you know, 10, 11 megajoules of energy where your lupins is going to be 13, 13 and a half. So instead of using, say, 15% lupins, you might bump it up to 20, 25%. So you're bumping up your energy content. Um, it, look, it, it's, it's a good mix. And it's interesting looking at grain prices, actually, in the last month or two, that oats have been pretty competitive. Normally we see oats, particularly because a lot of it go to the, um, the thoroughbred or the horse industry. Um, we see oats really highly priced. So, um, yeah, by all means, it's a safer type feed than some of the other cereal grains. And uh, it's just the digestibilities and lower energy that probably are the main issues. Perfect. Thank you, Jeff. Jeff, um, this is just a really quick one from Barbara. All she, Barbara says is, are you saying 23 kilograms live weight? And I suspect she's referring to your preferred sale weight of... of um, yeah. no, 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 no. Carcass weight, Barb. Carcass weight. Carcass yeah. weight. So yep. Yeah. So for a 47% dress, uh, which we tend to get more commonly in the eastern states than in WA, but um, for a 47% dress, that's about a 50 kilogram live weight. Perfect. Thank you. Now I've got uh, I've got a view on this myself, Jeff. But the question is asked of you: Is the cost of land factored into the total cost of carry calculations, as well as the labour unit costs for the profitability of sheep and land enterprises? That's from Craig. Generally, no. In my understanding, no, it's not so. And to be honest, and it really started back in the Millennium Drought. The the um, property prices are, are just going through the roof. Um, and it's a good point, actually, because you know, when I was talking to an agent just recently, then we were talking about, um, sorry, no, a bank manager, and we were talking about prices in southern New South Wales in some of the dry land areas, and you know, they were talking $1,500 an acre and that sort of thing. And it's very hard to look at, particularly on the cropping side, to, to see how they'll get out of that. Uh, potentially on the livestock side, um, and particularly sheep, um, it is the best ag industry to be in at the moment. So... But sorry, um, yeah, the generally my understanding is land prices probably aren't costed in. 
uh, again, it's probably something that should be. Yeah. So just on that there, Craig, in the home sacket benchmarking, we do not value uh, the land in the cost of production calculations, but we do value uh, all labour, uh, owner and employed included, with a... Um, with a standard industry rate for owner labour. So a few more uh, thank yous from some uh, from some impressed pre uh, uh, or, uh, attendees tonight. Thank you, Jeff and David. Great webinar. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Dean. Um, now, a question from Duncan. I've just been trying to decrypt this while you've been chatting, Jeff, but you might be able to help us. Uh, if you're going to co-mingle Two mobs yep. of sheep, I think that's the uh, uh, two mobs yep. of sheep. How long would you allow before before putting them in a feedlot? Yeah, okay. So if you're introducing a couple of different lines of sheep, how um, how long prior to putting in a feedlot? Um, look, generally we're looking at target to say a week to ten days prior to putting them into a feedlot situation. So they may have been trucked for you know eight hours or so. Um, they've been off water, they've been off feed, they're stressed and the like, so they need to settle down. Um, I'd probably look at joining them sooner than later. Uh, day, you know, time-wise, I couldn't really say. I don't know of any work that's been done with it, but again, to, um, and most people would, say if you've got two lines of lamb, come in on the same day, let's join them together, give them a week or so, and then put them into weight groups um, into the into the feedlot. Okay, so you will generally find your lighter weight lambs will be the ones with a higher shy feeder component. Um, so you might need to nurse them along a bit. But, um, yeah, I'd, I'd probably look at at least the first week, have them join before they go into the feedlot. And then if you do um, draft again into weight categories, um, two or three days before a feedlot would be good. But most people would have probably put them straight into the feedlot when they draft on the weight. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Jeff. All right, now we're starting to get to the end of the questions, Jeff. Um, yeah, one last one here from Steve. Steve asks, hello, Jeff. Curious on the effects of wet weather in a feedlot with regard to troughs versus feeders. Have any ideas here? Thanks from Steve. Yeah, it's an eternal problem too, but thankfully we don't get a lot of it during the periods that we normally feedlot. We don't get a lot of what, or excessive wet weather. Um, obviously with troughs, um, you'll have, unless they're covered, um, you'll have issues with wastage and then you've got to clean the troughs out. With your self-feeders, most, if not all self-feeders, have fairly good aprons or verandas um, or a design that minimises or, or really reduces all, all rain sort of impacts at all. So um, I've seen some very good trough type systems that are principally a self-feeder, so they can be covered. There's a little bit of cost involved in that sort of thing for sure. Um, and you've got to work in with your feeding method how you actually get the food into the trough um, but yeah you'll probably look at a bit of waste and the like once you get wet wet grain or wet uh, total mix ration um, you'll pretty well find the lambs won't eat and uh, we just don't want that in a feedlot situation yeah right yeah well thank you jeff um yep uh, another comment from craig here great webinar very informative thank you thank you craig much appreciated now uh, yeah, just want to just down to our last two questions here. I think is it safe to transition from barley to oats in lick feeders without sheep going off grain and back on? Right. Yep. Look, that that is a very good question, and people have been caught with it for sure. So generally, if you're going from barley to oats, you should be okay because you're going from a higher risk grain to a low risk grain. Just be mindful, and it's same if you're feeding pellets. Um, if you're buying in barley and you buy it from different um, properties or whatever, or different sources, you'll have to shandy it in, right? So if you're feeding one particular grain or a pellet, shandy it in, So and it's difficult in self-feeder. So what you would normally do is start putting a band of the new grain, whether it's the same type of grain or a new variety, put a band in there, um, and that'll start to filter through and the like, and generally change over within 10, 10 to 14 days. So it takes a little bit of work. Um, on the pellet side, if you're buying from the same pellet manufacturer, just be careful because the pellet mix that you bought last time, they might have had wheat, bought wheat at a cheap price, but the next lot of pellets you get may have been barley. 
Right, so you've just got to be careful and do the same as if you're changing grains if, when you're using pellets. So just be careful, shanty them in. It is a little bit difficult in self-feeders, um, but it, it's something to be wary of. But look, generally, if you're going from something like barley or wheat to oats, you should be, yeah, the risk is nowhere near as high as going from, say, oats to barley. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for that, Jeff. So, Jeff, um, that was our last sort of um, key question. <laughs> Robbie, Robbie's come back to us with a comment. He reckons 1500 bucks per acre sounds cheap. And, uh, yeah, in some areas it is, Robbie. No doubt it is. Um, uh, Probably selling. Land, so. Yeah. <laughs> if a lamb uses 15% of its energy requirements to walk around the paddock, how much would a single and twin bearing you use? Uh, just thinking about containment yeah. feeding, even though I'm in a high rainfall region. Yeah, again, another good question. It really is. You're on fire, Rob. Um, exactly right. Uh, the same sort of thing. And, and she's, you know, she's an energy deficit. We cannot feed, particularly at the peak of lactation, which is sort of three to four weeks after lambing. We cannot feed a ewe enough. We cannot get enough grain into her to meet her requirements. She's and she's got up to three and a half times the requirement of a weather just to maintain and she's got all that milk production that's stripping the fat off her back. It's going to make it more difficult for her to get back in condition to join and give you lambs next time. So look, all for it. Um, your twin bearing use, yeah, there's there's recommendations out there for trying to uh, improve lamb survivals and the like. Use of survival is critical as well, and that's something that's really shown through with lifetime ewe stuff and that too, you know, what's a ewe worth to you over her lifetime? So that little bit of extra grain during lambing, prior to weaning and the like, um, it, the cost benefit's going to be, yeah, well and truly there. Excellent. Thank you, Jeff. So, Jeff, that's actually the last of the, um, last of the questions here, and there's just a few... Thank yous coming through. Thanks, fellas. I really appreciate the help. Very valuable information. Thanks for John. Steve said thanks for the information and well-presented webinar. Really appreciate the opportunity to participate in the QA, Q and A. Cheers from Steve. So thanks, Steve, um, and thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Scott. So yeah, happy um, uh, positive comments coming through there, Jeff. And um, well, I think that's uh, that's pretty much wrapped it up. Cool. So, Jeff, I'd like to thank you on behalf of the audience tonight, myself, and, and on behalf of MLA. Um, I think you've done a great job, and you know, we, we, we um, definitely will, will be keen to consider other topics that you might want to present in the future, and um, we can cross that bridge when we get there. But, look, I'll, I'll um, take the opportunity to just let everyone know about the survey at the end there, if you get the opportunity to... Um, Fill that out. Be much appreciated. Let Jeff and I know, and MLA, MLA as well, uh, what you thought the good and the bad aspects of the webinar are. Don't forget, next week we've got uh, Bruce Allworth joining us on Thursday night, 8 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. He's going to be talking to the issue of shearing uh, uh, lambs, whether that increases growth rates, and, and in what instances you would do it, and where you may not. And don't forget to pass on this opportunity for. Um, other producers out there, if you've got friends, family, networks, work or social that would benefit from participating in the webinars, then don't forget to click them the registration link. Um, if you need it, just get in touch with me. If you've got it, just send it straight to them and, and they can be part of the fun as well. Now, Jeff, there was actually one last question here from Andrew Ridgeway. Oh, there's a name from the past, yep. So, Jeff, a yeah. question for the future. How to feed ewes with young lambs without disturbing them? Oh, so it's a question for the future. So Andrew doesn't expect us to answer it tonight. but uh, Can I put it in? Yeah, for sure. Can I, can and he's yeah. talking about grain. Um, yeah, yep. Yeah. So I take it the main point being mismothering. I, I guess so, the reducing the risk. Yeah, look, DPI actually, the recommendation um, is to feed mid, mid to late afternoon because the feeling generally is even though ewes will lamb across the day and night, that most lambs at that time have been able to bond. You know, they've had at least three or four hours to bond to the ewe. Um, and so feeding mid to late afternoon, 
There's a couple of anecdotal things that I find really interesting. Um, one producer tells me that he only goes into the paddock with one um, one particular vehicle um, and uses that same vehicle each time. So they associate feeding with that vehicle. I think that's a really, really interesting point. And another producer out at Carathool, actually in, in Western New South Wales, said that he fed at night um, without lights, and, but it was no worries out there because they haven't got any trees. And that seemed to minimise the risk of uh, mismothering the light. Um, and, and I guess it's, it's, I'm not a fan of necessarily feeding um, twin bearers. I would prefer to see twin bearing use pretty well left alone on self feeder systems. Single bearers, yeah, we can run them on top of each other and they'll keep their lamb alive, provided the scanning accuracy is there. Um, and some interesting stuff that they do a lot in Western Australia, but we don't cotton, we haven't cottoned on to it much in eastern states, but um, broadcasting something like lupins, give them two weeks worth of supplementary feed in one go by using a super spreader or, or a combine, run it across the paddock, the ewes will, as they graze, be picking up the supplement, right? picking up the lupins. Now that's generally good for the larger grains like our corn or our pulses. So you can look at that sort of stuff. If you're using cereal grains, you don't want to spread it out too far between the feeds because of the risk of acidosis. Um, to be honest, during lambing, probably the best because protein requirements do go through the roof as well for ewes. Probably better to look at something like a um, like a pulse, a lupins or beans or peas. Right, yeah, perfect. Thanks for that, Jeff. So, Jeff, that, that definitely wraps up the questions and um, you've done a really stellar job to get through them all there in such a thorough manner and um, it'll, it definitely shows in the amount of um, positive feedback we got here. So, go. Oh, thanks, Jeff. And, um, and for the audience, thanks for attending and, and participating in such a vigorous way and we look forward to seeing you online in the near future. Right out, Jeff. So, uh, on behalf of I'm Sack at MLA. Oh, thank you very much and we'll have a good evening. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good luck with it. Thanks, Jeff. Cheers. Bye-bye.